so thanks uh, for for having me. I'm I'm glad to to have the honor to uh, present here today. So just share my screen uh, and then. Oh. Okay, so now normally you should be see my uh, presentation. So as uh, introduced um, by Carlos, I will be presenting today a bit uh, about the acoustic receiver network we have in Belgium. Uh, so, and we use it to know more about the whereabouts of fish. But first of all, let's set the scene. Uh, so I started doing my research on offshore wind farms in Belgium uh, to investigate the movement behavior of cod. Uh, that was, what was the topic of my PhD study, which I started in 2009. And that was the moment that the first offshore wind farms were um, developed in the Belgian part of the North Sea. <clears throat> and we wanted to know what would be the impact of these uh, devices on the movement ecology and behavior of uh, several species and uh, cod was one of these. And we uh, used several techniques to investigate this. And one of the techniques was using acoustic telemetry. Um, and although the study uh, provided us a lot of information about uh, why and how cod uses these artificial devices uh, during their life cycle, we also had a lot of questions remaining at the end of the study. Uh, so the study revealed that actually cod is attracted to these wind farms for part of the year. Uh, they are there in summer and they feed around the structures. But in the winter time, all the fish leave uh, and we didn't have any clue where the fish were going to because we only had a, a small scale study around these wind farm. Uh, so that made us think about some next steps. Uh, and one of these was to extend the network that we had. So we started with maybe 10 receivers, and nowadays we have a network of over 100 receivers covering uh, larger areas in the Belgian part of the North Sea and some Belgian rivers, um, which greatly helps to do some investigation on uh, uh, fish movement. Um, and of course, uh, tracking animals, it's, it's something that is done uh, on many places in the world and on a, a variety of species. However, we have one uh, big problem, and that is that GPS signals don't work on the water. So for all uh, land mammals uh, or uh, uh, animals living in the water that do surface, uh, you can use GPS technology. Uh, which is the easiest way to track individuals. Uh, but as we are working on fish which don't come to the surface, GPS was not an option. So we had to look for some alternative uh, technologies. And there is a variety of technologies that exist. I just list some here. Uh, so you have radio telemetry, acoustic telemetry, you can put archival tags, pit tagging, uh, or also put this pop-up satellite tags. So you have these archival tags that uh, surface at a specific moment, and then they go to, to the surface, and then they can send their uh, information to a satellite. Um, each of these technologies has uh, some advantages and disadvantages, uh, and it's depending on the, the study, the area you're working in, uh, which type of, 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 whether it's marine or freshwater environment you're working on, that will decide which of the technology, which technologies best suits uh, your questions at stake. Um, and for the work we are doing, uh, we focused on acoustic telemetry. So I won't go in too much detail of each of the technologies, uh, here, but if you would have some questions still on the different technologies at the end of the presentations, you can then always ask it. Um, we used acoustic telemetry and we made a YouTube video to explain what it is and how it works. So we'll just have a look at this. 
galactic ecosystems are full of life. Antic salmon migrate in and out of rivers to spawn. Sharks can move long distances in the ocean. Lobsters move around the ocean floor foraging. Eels migrate incredible distances to spawn at sea. Sunfish roam the wide ocean. Tulips can dive down to more than 1,000 meters. Understanding where, when, and why animals move is necessary to adequately protect and manage them in a sustainable way. On land, we can use GPS to track animals, but that doesn't work in water. So how can scientists get this information when animals live underwater? One way to do that is using acoustic telemetry. Telemetry means to measure from a distance, and acoustic means using sounds. So scientists use acoustic telemetry to track animals from a distance using sounds. Once the study animals are caught, they undergo a small surgery so the scientists can implant acoustic transmitters. For larger fish like sharks and tunas, or for animals with a hard shell like lobsters, the acoustic transmitters are attached externally. These transmitters emit a sound through a sequence of pulses. The sequence is unique for each tag, so each animal has a unique ID. The IDs can be detected when the tagged animals swim close to receivers, as the receivers detect the sound emitted by the tag. Researchers have a network of thousands of receivers across Europe to track aquatic animals. The receiver information provides data on when and where animals move, but it can also assist scientists in understanding why they move. Such Okay, I'll uh, pause the, vid the video there. So this should give you some more insight in how the technology works. Uh, so you have these tags which are implanted or attached to the animal. They send out uh, an acoustic signal and then the signal is uh, received by a receiver if the fish is close enough. Uh, there are some other technologies, as I mentioned. Uh, we also have another video. Um, explaining each of these technologies. I won't play that video now, but afterwards, if you want to have a closer look to this, uh, and want to know more about all these uh, technologies, you can just watch the movie. Um, okay. So that's in general how acoustic telemetry works. And then we go to the Belgian network. So uh, in Belgium, um, we actually use two of the techniques. So we mainly use acoustic telemetry, but the last years we also use these data storage tags or DSTs uh, to get some insights. Uh, but today I will focus on the acoustic telemetry part. And in Belgium, we actually make a distinction between a permanent network that we have and some temporal networks. And the permanent network, uh, yeah, you, here you see a part of it. So each black dot is uh, a location where we have these acoustic receivers. And as the, ma the name mentions, it's year round. So since 2014, we have this network in water and it's con continuously there. Of course, over time, some, sometimes the stations uh, gets removed uh, or relocated. Uh, because sometimes a location is not ideal or too difficult or we have too many losses. Uh, so once in a while we do some changes, but overall we want to keep it as constant and as possible. Uh, and this permanent network, we have both at the Belgian part of the North Sea. It's mainly focusing around the coastal areas, but we also do have some offshore stations uh, which are very valuable. And then we also have um, some arrays of receivers in an estuary, being uh, the, the Stealth estuary. And then also uh, inland, we have a couple of river, rivers and canals where we do have uh, devices. So in this way, we can have a look to the purely marine and purely freshwater species, but also get some insights of diadroma species that move between these environments. However, sometimes this permanent network is not sufficient. If you have a specific question at stake, uh, sometimes this, this large array 
won't give you all the details needed because it, it, it's more on a, a larger regional um, area. And that's why we also have these temporal networks. So the, um, on request, we can put some extra receivers at a specific location. So what I'm showing here are some wind turbines uh, in one of the wind farms in Belgium. So, so the black line are the cables and each gray circle is a distance around the wind farm. And then the green dots indicate where we put these receivers. So in this uh, situation, we put about 20 extra receivers in the water to get some uh, information on the, the small scale movements within a wind farm for um, a couple of species. So there we focused on, on, on some flatfish, but also on uh, sea bass to see whether and how they use the wind farm area, do they stick to the turbines or do they move into the sandy areas? Um, so by having the combination of this permanent and temporal network, we can answer both, uh, both um, questions more at, at, at a broader scale or very detailed uh, movement ecology of the individuals. For the permanent network, we mainly use existing infrastructure to attach our receivers. So here you see a navigation buoy in the Belgian part of the North Sea. And then this yellow tube you see, that's actually where we attach the receiver. I'll show you in a minute how the, the details of these attachments look. But sometimes there are no structures available on the site where you want to perform your research. Uh, so in the temporal network, we mainly use this, we call it tripods, uh, on which we put the mooring on the seabed or, or the, the bottom of the, the river. Um, and then we have on top a float with the receiver. But these are receivers with a built-in acoustic release mechanism. So we can uh, decide when the receiver should, should release. The floats come to the surface. It takes along a tethered line, which is inside the central beam. And then we can hold up the entire structure. So in this way, we also don't leave anything at the bottom, because this is also a request from a federal government in Belgium that actually we don't leave anything uh, at the seabed uh, when we deploy stuff. Uh, so here you see some details on uh, what we have on the navigation board for the permanent network. So actually we have this loop uh, and we have a chain and a cable. So on the chain, we have, it's a chain of about five meters length on which we do some tubing. So the yellow thing you see, it's just something we put over the chain to protect both the chain, but also the infrastructure that we attach it to. And then we have a weight attached to it so that it doesn't flow too much in the current. And then we have an extra cable. Uh, and on that cable, we attach the receiver, uh, which is then also attached to the, the infrastructure. Um, and then of, on the frames, uh, we mainly focus, of course, on acoustic telemetry. But sometimes we also put other devices um, then take some environmental measurements uh, or, or sounds, for instance. So here you see uh, a, a sound measuring device, um, a sea pot to listen to uh, marine mammals. We can add uh, current meters. Um, here we have an, an artificial frame to see how Bentos uh, colonizes um, these frames and, and what, what are the species that, that grow on it. Uh, and here we have something to measure the sounds in the water. So having these structures in the water, it also allows us to do uh, additional measurements. So here once more, there's then the, the, the complete network. We have a paper on that, which was published in 2019, where we explain actually why we have this network, what it does, uh, and why, what are all the benefits of having it. So here you see we have the Belgian part of the North Sea, this uh, scalp estuary system, and then some rivers here, and that's a canal system we have uh, as well in Belgium. So here you can already see 
for maybe people that know a bit uh, our region, that actually we go through the Netherlands as well. So although this is the Belgian network, because the diadromous fish from the river need to go through the Netherlands to come in Belgian uh, marine waters, we also have an agreement with the, the, the Dutch government to put equipment in their uh, waters to be able to follow up um, these movements. But okay, uh, one of the most important questions, uh, why do you need such a network? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, so such a network, uh, of course, um, it has a lot of value related to the research we do. To, um, not only do we want to gather ecological knowledge of a species, but we, we also want to assess specific impacts, uh, like having these wind farms at sea or having dams in the water that uh, uh, form a barrier for fish movements. It also helps to perform species conservation. If you know these impacts, uh, we can give some suggestions um, what we can do to, to better manage the species. Uh, so we have this conservation and this fisheries or river management uh, options you get available having such a network. Of course, having a network, it also um, promotes other things. Uh, and I listed some here. Uh, of course, collaborations. Since we have this network, we started uh, this network with two institutes in Flanders, uh, but nowadays I think it are more than eight different institutes in Belgium that use our network. So it's still two institutes that are responsible for the maintenance of the network to make sure it's there and it's working uh, and the data flows towards the data system, which I will explain in a minute. But then we have a lot of users uh, because the network is there there's an uh, additional advantage of, of performing research. Not only uh, do they need less funds because the infrastructure is already in the water and they only need to pay for tax, um, but they also give some opportunities. Uh, so some scientific questions that couldn't be uh, asked or tackled before can now be tackled, uh, or it allows you to do some pilot studies if you have some small, funding available or some seeding money uh, that you just do a test, you see whether or not something is feasible, and then you can apply for uh, more fundamental funding uh, to, to perform on the proper research. But it also allows us to tackle these larger questions because we don't work anymore on an institutional level or on a small area, we broaden the scope. Uh, so this helps to also tackle more large scale questions. I just gave some examples here um, of collaborations that I'm uh, involved in that in the past, I think two or three years, uh, a lot of collaborative papers have been written or are in the process of being written. And it's just by having this network that I got these opportunities to be involved in all these science uh, and, and help um, to have these papers being written. Um, but also we got more fundamental uh, funding uh, by having this network. So I, I, here I just list a couple of projects which are currently running or will start. Um, and that actually are a bit of a result of having the network. Um, so here in Fish uh, OA, uh, OWF and Fish Intel, it's two projects um, in, 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 in more in the channel area, the English channel area, where we collaborate with France and the United Kingdom to investigate uh, the movements of sea bass. Uh, so it also helps to start performing research on a more international level. Uh, we don't only look to what is the sea bus doing in the Belgian waters, but we start collaborating with neighboring countries um, and, and, and have in this way a, a more fundamental impact on possible uh, management of species. Uh, the project with Tenet, Tenet is an, uh, an industry company 
so they wanted to know what's the impact of their offshore cables, uh, the electric magnetic fields that they produce, so what's the impact on fish. And as we had this network, uh, we were a very uh, interesting partner to collaborate because it reduced the amount of funding needed to be able to perform this research. Straits, uh, this uh, strategic infrastructure for animal tracking in European seas, is a Horizon Europe project that will start soon, but I'll, I'll give some more information in a minute. And then we also had this cost action to actually bring what we have in Belgium to a European level and to have it all integrated. Um, so on, on, on the European level. Uh, yeah, so some more examples on the advantage of, of, of not only having this network, but also sharing the data. Uh, so here's some other projects we got together with people in the Netherlands, just by having this network, um, they um, yeah, added this to their projects. We uh, have some joint PhD students and it allowed us to do some, as I mentioned be before, this uh, pilot studies or to, to do some extra tagging because the network is present. Um, and so as the fish is saying, uh, collaborating leads to more publications and funding opportunities. So since we have this network, we had a lot of um, collaborations starting. So this is a bit an overview of what we did in Belgium. It says 1,300 animals of more than 18 species, uh, but this is already a bit outdated. So it's, I think, uh, an overview of a couple of years ago. So we we work on a multitude of species, depending on, on the interest of uh, specific companies, on ecological questions. Um, uh, but of course, we have a couple of species that, that we investigate more in and, and that we, we have longer term uh, projects or funding. Um, so we have been working for a long time with the Tway Chats, the Yields, Sea Bass, Cod, and some uh, Salmon. And then I just want to say that uh, although the initiative started as something from Belgium, it's now all integrated in the European tracking network. So having several institutes working together, together in Belgium, we thought like, okay, it's not only having the infrastructure, but it's also about the data and the data sharing and have, have a common data platform. So we developed something for Belgium, but then soon uh, other Institutes outside Belgium started asking whether they could join our initiative. And then uh, through this cost action that we now have running, we decided to uh, make this something pan-European. So we have this data platform called the European Tracking Network, where people from all across Europe can add their data. Uh, data is first on the moratorium, of course, but uh, when people are ready to open up, the data can become open access. So all the blue dots you see are that, are that are running projects, the red dots are projects that are finished. Uh, currently we have more than 350 users of this data system. We have 680 million detections coming from this acoustic telemetry in the system. Over 17,000 animals have been tagged and more than 100 institutes are involved in this initiative. Making it very interesting because as you all know, fish don't have uh, administrative borders. So the movement doesn't stop at the border of a country. So we need this international collaborations and by having a centralized data system where you can easily share information among uh, institutes and partners greatly helps to uh, work on this international level. So, so I just want to show, uh, yeah, that's a bit a uh, mistake, how the data flow goes. Um, it, it looks a bit like a complicated slide and I don't think you need to remember everything of the slide, but I, I just want to give, give a quick overview so of course, first of all, we have our equipment in the water, the fish are being tagged, they pass by the receivers and the data is stored on these receivers. 
when we then go into the fields, this data is read out and then we bring it to this uh, ETN portal. But we don't only have the metadata and the data of the, of, of the fish and the receivers. We also need to know who's involved, what's the project about, uh, where is it performed? So we also gather a lot of metadata. And both this metadata and data flows to the central system uh, where you can access the data, where you can work with it. Uh, for the more technical people, it's a Postgres uh, SQL database. Uh, so it's a spatial database. Um, and it's linked to other data systems that are available. So IMIS is actually a project, uh, a person's database. So all the information of the people involved in these uh, projects got registered in this other database and then data is exchanged. And all the raw data that is stored in ETN and all the files that are uploaded to the system are also um, archived in this marine data archive. So we work with this fair data transit uh, um, principles. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you're, a um, um, if you're familiar with this fair data principles, but it's all about making sure that the data that is, that is there, that the people can find it, that they can access it and that they can reuse it. So of course, as long as we are performing our project and um, the study is not finished, everything remains confidential. But once the project is finished and you've written up all what you wanted to write and everything's published, data should become open access. Um, and this system greatly helps to do this. And then linked to the data system, we also have an um, air shiny application where you can visualize all the data. Um, and we also have an, a, a GitHub repository and a, a RStudio on the server where people can perform their uh, analysis. And we also uh, maintain an, an, an R package. So linked to the data system that you can quickly call your data and do the analysis uh, needed. I won't go in more detail on this data flow and all these different uh, applications we have, uh, but we do have a YouTube, YouTube channel. And if people are interested, we have some dedicated webinars there where we go over, go over all the details. Uh, so if you really work with the data, you can check it there. Uh, so yeah, the statistics I already had. And then on the European level, so I just want to show, these are currently the receivers in the water. So where the blue dots are, there we now have active receivers listening to fish. So it's also very interesting to know if you start study, to know yeah, is somebody uh, active in our in a neighboring river or if in a river that is uh, shared among the different countries. Um, I'm more working on the marine environment, so I focused here. But here you can see in the Mediterranean, we have receivers all over the place. And the same here in, um, in, the, in, in the North Sea and the English Channel area. So you can see that here we have quite some extensive networks of receivers. So if we tag something in Belgium, chances are fairly high that it gets picked up in the Netherlands or the UK or France. Uh, so also your research becomes uh, yeah, usable on, an, on a larger geographic area. And then I just wanted to give, to give some more information on this Straits project. So it's Strategic Infrastructure for Improved Animal Tracking in European Seas. It's a new Horizon Europe that just got granted and where we want to uh, build four arrays on strategic locations across Europe to, my, uh, to investigate my, uh, yeah, the, the, the movement ecology of highly migratory species. Uh, like for instance, tuna being tagged in Denmark will then be able to be detected when they move into the Mediterranean. Of course, this is more important on a uh, marine level, 
which for Switzerland um, isn't uh, really the case, but it's just to showcase you by having this network and having these collaborations, we get much higher chances to get this uh, high level funding like Horizon Europe, where you collaborate in a much larger scale with, with people. Uh, okay, and uh, with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, so, um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. And here I just give some more information. So we have a Twitter account. You can always contact me. Some interesting links to check. And as I mentioned, we have this YouTube channel. I just posted two videos here, but once you're in the channel, you can link to all the other videos that we have. Um, and with this, um, I'm happy to answer your questions.